Paris, thank you for your time today. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. You know what? When I heard that I was doing unfiltered, first of all, I know you taught for many years and you have the patience of Job, which um, talking with me, you're going to need that because this is my favorite <laughs> subject. So you're going to have to wrap me like a producer. But the unfiltered part is really what I'm attracted to as well. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I work at Fox. Um, I can do the news and I've done it for many years and I can on the Faulkner focus, break the stories and do all of that and have an unscripted talk show and do all of that, but still be able to handle unfortunate tragedies and news as they come along and breaking news. But what no one ever asks you about is foundationally, how do you get ready for those biggest moments? How do you put in a place the tragedies that you cover? And do you ever hear anything that's a great story that you might not tell on the news. And my answer back is always one word, faith. That, that's what people don't ask me about. That's where I foundationally go. That's, those are the stories. Those are the, the testimonies in that category that are coming out all the time. And we don't see enough of them. And I think because we don't see faith and miracles and all of that being talked about and celebrated. I mean, it's sometimes tolerated in certain areas of the media. But very few places you go where you're unfiltered enough on that platform, like with Ryan right here, Ryan McKeel, <laughs> right here, you can be unfiltered. Very few places where you can go and be who you are. And I think that when it comes to faith and moving mountains in your life, I am here to say that faith still moves mountains and the power of prayer and miracles is as real as ever. And you ought to get that news from a journalist. Because if there's anything you ought to know about me, if I'm going to ask you to trust what I say, is how I know important things come from people who pray. I pray over the words that I speak. The vulnerability came from humility and listening to other people tell me things about what I had covered that I did not know. So uh, Colorado mom with her two teenage kids, the Batman movie. Shooting starts inside that theater. And we all know it by the perpetrator, James Holmes with the wild hair and, and all of that. And they found him guilty of killing a lot of people. But what I didn't know was how much faith was part of that story. And when you learn how a family, a mom and her two young girls, she never thought she'd be in that environment. She had teenagers like I do. She didn't want to be there. I mean, she, a midnight showing of the Batman movie. She's like, I could sleep. I mean, I think most parents think that. But the vulnerability for me came from how much greater a responsibility I had now to get the story right and only once. Because in news, you'll often hear us say, well, this story, this blah, blah, blah is fluid and the facts are coming in and they may, you know, things may change as we get along the number here of, of tragedy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't do any of that. It had to be right. And because it wasn't just going to be the, te the faith testimonies of the people and the stories that I wrote, the 19 of them, some of them were going to be touching other people who were going through things. Some people were going to be attracted to faith still moves mountains for reasons that I couldn't even imagine. So if the Lord was going to bring in a bounty of people doing what I did in 2020 on the day of Christmas, praying and saying, Lord, are you even hearing me anymore? If this book is going to get them to lean back in and start talking to God, I am completely exposed and it's a frightening place to be because what if I have my own doubt in a moment when somebody is telling me their story? Like when Danny met Doug, a woman who had spent her younger years in nursing homes because doctors basically were in give up mode and she was around palliative and hospice care patients when she was young, she was in a wheelchair and, and when you when you read that story, by the way, another contemporary story. So these miracles are within us and around us all the time. When you see that Danny meets the love of her life, who's close to her age in a nursing home environment, 
where more people died than lived around her. And then in their life together, they start to go to church. And in that life with, with Doug, she walks one day at church. Now, the doctor said that that would never happen. But we know with faith, with prayer, anything is possible. And when we lean into God, I promise you, he leans into us. Uh, it's not a Pop-Tart. <laughs> it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And it's in his time. We all know that. But it bears saying it over and over and over because Gallup in 1944 said that we were almost 100% faith filled in this country. And that we believe that God heard our prayers. And then fast forward to the last four or five years and Gallup says, no, we're still doing the same survey and only 40% people, 40 of people who believe at all believe that God intervenes in any kind of a way. I mean, think about the things in your life that have dropped off at that percentage. They're probably not in your life anymore in terms of how important they would be or whether or not they have believability. You wouldn't be doing them. So I had to be really careful as I was writing this book that I kept everybody in mind, not just the subjects that I was interviewing and the stories that I was telling. But if I was going to be moved to do something more historical and it was going to be a posthumous storytelling, the responsibility was huge with General George S. Patton saying that he carried faith with him and, and prayed with chaplains before the Battle of the Bulge. I'm going to need some sources. Well, only God could bring Benjamin Patton, his grandson, into my life. Like, let's just face it. <laughs> I'm a girl who doesn't get out much. I'm always working and raising kids and doing whatever. So it was the responsibility that brought on the vulnerability. And I think now there were times when I was scared. But it was a short process because Fox News book said, if we're doing this, we're doing it now. You've got 90 days to get it together. And I said, no one writes a book in that time. Someone does. And you and I know her. Awkward to talk about myself in the third person. You know <laughs> Let, let's start at the beginning of this. Sure. How did this project start? It was a little bit. Strange. I, I, I had lost my father to pancreatic cancer after an eight year battle and then lost my my dog and really best friend of, of 15 years about six months after that. And then COVID hit and ended up losing a grandmother and, and two aunts as well. And during that time when we were so isolated, we were sort of you know unable to really honor the people that we had lost in the traditional ways that we were accustomed to. And and I felt lonely in those moments feeling that I was struggling with something and not able to connect to other individuals uh, about it and so I was looking for ways to sort of reconnect to my dad and and we had always had this bond of adventure together we had done all sorts of adventures all over the world ever since I was a little kid and so I, I decided to write his name on one of my surfboards and I sort of turned to surfing during that time as a way to you know de-stress and cope with some of the things I was dealing with and so I I put his name on one of my surfboards and paddled him out into the ocean. And, and it was in that moment that I, I felt connected to him again, that we were on another adventure together. And it was something that I was looking for for a long time. And, and so because of everything that was going on in the world, I thought that there was other people also who were sort of struggling in, in a similar way, feeling sort of lost and alone and unable to honor the people that they had lost. And so I came out of the water and grabbed my phone, recorded a video on TikTok and, and put it up there. And it was really just this, this open invitation to anyone who was struggling, who had a loved one who had a connection to the ocean or loved nature. And I didn't have any expectations that anything would happen to it. And I woke up the next morning and the video had gone viral and I was getting submissions from people all over the world. And, and so I decided to start that project. Really what it is, is just writing the names of these lost loved ones on surfboards as a way to memorialize them out there and in a place that was important to them. Because as I'm looking at you right now, I'm assuming, I'm thinking that board behind you has what, at least a hundred names on it? 2031. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy my essay was, was yeah. too low though. Yeah, they all have about around 2000 on them. They're, this one's- They uh, all, how many surfboards have you filled? So I have three done. The fourth one is just finishing up now and I'll be putting all the names on. I have another 
uh, 1800 names to go on right now. So in total, we've had sort of over 7,000 names so far submitted to us. Sometimes social media can be divisive. It, it can mm -hmm. cause arguments. The community, whether it's on your TikTok or, or the Instagram, which is how we connected, how has this given you encouragement? Yeah, I, I had been, you know, as we all are, involved in social media and had, you know, certain videos do well or pictures do well. A lot of my social media had been dedicated to my dog that I'd lost. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of suppression. There's sort of definitely a lot of, you know, divisiveness on, on social media. And, and you know, I hadn't ever... I had never used it necessarily for something good. I mean, I had shared, you know, pictures of, of the dogs and adventures and that sort of thing, but it was never something to unite people around the world for the, you know, a common goal in that way. And especially to, to heal people that felt disconnected. I never really thought of what social media should really be as a way to connect us over positive things. And that ended up really happened. So when I saw, you know, you know, parents commenting about a lost child, they lost it, you know, four and a half years old or, people in hospice care who had a dying wish to go out on, you know, into the ocean again, it, it, my vulnerability in those moments about my father and my dog, I think encourage other people to share. And then the more people that shared their stories of their loved ones and were vulnerable and, and courageous to do so, I think it, it gave the confidence to other people to do the same thing. And we've created this, this community of people that, you know, you're, it's a healing thing to see other people sharing about that because grief is, is often such a lonely journey to take and, and you feel that at so many points during it and so to see other people sharing their own grief and what they're going through i think gives people a sense of comfort and that's a lot of what the project has been able to to offer is people reading comments feel a comfort in that and then seeing their loved ones out there in a place that they loved also gives them a sense of comfort too so it's it's sort of something that we're doing all together to help heal in a difficult time what about that deployment solidified? This is what you were meant to do. This is what you're built for. Initially, I wanted to come in to the military and the special operations, you know, post 9 11, because I was pissed off and I wanted to be part of the fight in response. And I, I anticipated doing, you know, just my five year contract and then getting out and, you know, having fulfilled that desire and then take those skills to another sector of, of United States government work, namely the Secret Service. That's what I, that was my initial goal. But on that trip, like you just said, in, in 2011, you know, it was nine months, mostly down to Kandahar. And, you know, just the, the brotherhood that was formed with the guys that I was working with and their level of expertise, both in terms of combat and tactics as leaders, um, as men, as great men that I was learning from every day, just it, like a tidal wave, like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and then just that satisfaction about being involved in uh, national security, you know, at the highest of levels, uh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else that would give me that same level of satisfaction. So yeah, man, that was really where I fell in love with the profession and decided to turn it into my, my, my career. You busted your butt to get back physically. So jujitsu, I believe when you, when you were teaching, there was lunch workouts. When you got to return to Afghanistan, when you returned to, I hope it's the right term, but your band of brothers, mm -hmm. when you're fighting for your country, how rewarding was that? it's tough to quantify it, man. Um, you know, it was, I had this envision in my mind in the earlier phases of my recovery of me, you know, getting off of that C-130 back in Afghanistan with my arms raised, you know, and being like, Hey, I'm back. Uh, and kind of hitting the top of that, of that ridge line. But even when I, when I was still recovering and I was going through more advanced training, that, that focus shifted from it being about me and me, achieving my goals to me doing something for a greater cause, which was my teammates. I, I, all, like most of these roads, man, lead back to the, to the guys I got the opportunity to work with. So I, I had put them as my motivation, inspiration and, and buried into my why while I was going through all this, all these, these, this training and the struggles and the adversity. So um, that the moment was, you know, I did get to raise my hands, like, you know, Rocky at the end of the fight, like I won, but 
you know, it was, it was more about, okay, I'm here and I've been training to be an asset for these guys and for this team now for, for over a year out of my mind doing so. So while it felt great, I immediately found myself at the bottom of the next ridge line that I needed to start climbing immediately. So it was a very short lived kind of celebration, uh, one that I certainly had, but then it was like, okay, man, not, now you're back in the game and you need to get focused because you still have a lot of work you need to do. And there's a lot at stake. One of the things that caught my attention and has been challenging me um, is the idea of increasing your intellectual stock. So what are some ways that you initially did this? And if you're okay answering this to follow up, what are some ways you're currently doing that? I don't know if it's as a father. I don't know if, if it's, if it's um, your, your work, um, uh, the special forces still. I just love the idea of increasing your intellectual stock. And I'm trying to work on that myself in some different ways. And I'd love to hear where that came from. And if you're comfortable sharing some ways that you're currently working on increasing your intellectual stock. Awesome question. I am so glad you asked that. I'm not sure anyone's asked me that before. I eventually, and thankfully quickly, although it was a difficult pill to swallow, realized that no matter how much time I spent in the gym or on the track or in the pool, I was not going to be as physically dominant as I was with two legs. That was difficult because I grew up an athlete, as an MMA fighter, as a, as a hard charging physical guy. I was, you know, 80% brawn, 20% brain. And I enjoyed it. My teammates, that's what they asked of me. It was kind of a win-win for everybody. Once I came to that realization, it was like, okay, how do I increase my value otherwise to make up the gap for what I'm going to lose physically? And you know, when you think about a Green Beret or a Navy SEAL or an Army Ranger or anyone that's in the special operations community, you typically think of the cool guy stuff, like kicking down doors, shooting bad guys in the face, jumping out of planes, blowing shit up, right? Like that stuff, which is stuff that we certainly do, but there are an entirely different host of skill sets uh, that really make us successful, kind of the softer side of our business. So I knew that at this point of my career that those things existed. Uh, I didn't do any of those things prior, but I knew that they were there and they were valuable. So I essentially just forced myself into those different lanes, which started for me in the hospital. So like, rather than reading about kinesiology and exercise physiology and nutrition yeah. and combatives and marksmanship, like those were, that was the type of information that I would consume when I would be reading or studying. Rather than that, I was reading about cultural dynamics of Afghanistan. I was reading about campaign planning, military strategy. I was increasing my foreign language capacity. So I really went down this like crazy nerd road of all these things that we do, uh, operating mostly on blind faith that that would provide the value gap that I needed to make up and still be the asset that I needed to be if and when I got back to the team. So that's what, that, that's what that looked like initially. And to kind of go full circle, when I did get off the plane in Afghanistan, two years later in Afghanistan, um, for my first deployment as an APT, I was able to employ a lot of those skill sets um, and capabilities that I had forced myself to learn, which was painful, Ryan, because I really didn't enjoy it. So it was pure discipline and faith that enabled me to do those things but I was able to actually employ some of that stuff for the, for the greater good of the mission and for the team. And the second part of your question um, is, yeah, of course. I mean, that really was the catalyst for me to see the value in our, our brains being the, the most casualty producing weapon we have as human beings. Um, that is our greatest asset, is our brains and our ability to think and our intellect more so than how much I can bench press and how fast I can run. Those, those physical, tangible, quantifiable accomplishments really don't mean all that much uh, if you don't have the brain power to make the correct decisions at the right time and analyze your environment and you know, rapidly conduct risk assessment. All those things happen by increasing your cerebral capacity. So um, yeah, I pursue that stuff to this day. Um, you know, kind of one of maybe the highlights to point on is you know, about halfway through my master's degree, in psychology, which 
you know, is something that I've grown to be interested in. And I see value in that both as a Green Beret and then just throughout life, you know, understanding and appreciation for how people think and, and why people think a certain way. And then lastly, on this point is, you know, I'm reached out to constantly, Ryan, by, by aspiring uh, soft guys or gals. Like, hey, I want to be a Green Beret. I want to do this. Like, do you have any recommendations? And out of the gate, almost certainly I'll ask, you know, what are you reading? And they typically don't expect that question coming back from me. They, again, their mind is more about maximum physical, and phys physical capabilities and, and this aggressive go-getter attitude. And, and those are all important, but what are you reading? Tell me about what you're studying. Because again, I don't, I, I need you to be able to run fast, but more than that, I need you to be smart and educated and have a high degree of intelligence that, that you can use your brain effectively within these high stress environments. So I can't possibly undervalue how important that is, whether you want to come into soft or whether you're already in it, or really regardless of what sector you're within, you know, I challenge people to be pushing those, those cerebral capacities um, every single day. Since COVID, it's kind of amplified some things in our society. What are some shifts? What are some worries? What are some concerns that you're seeing as a pastor over the past few years? Whew, yeah, that's a big question. So yeah, I started pastoring 16 years ago. I planted a church and I'm still pastoring that church today. So um, I've watched a lot of shifts happen. And as you said, they've, they've accelerated in the last several years. So, so here's what I would say. I would say um, the um, Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, followed by the George Floyd death in uh, Minnesota, were launching pads of a lot of social change. Um, in addition to that, you in the middle of those two events, you had the election of Donald Trump, which was also, um, you know, a cultural, you know, kind of blow up. And then you had COVID right after that. So what's happened over that string of years, I, I would say in the last seven years, um, there's been a massive infiltration of what I would say are really kind of secular ideology that for, for a long time just kind of laid dormant inside of the institutions of universities. Um, you know, I was a student at Vanderbilt Divinity uh, back in 2010, and I stayed for about a year and a half before I finally just said, no more, I cannot do this. Um, not because of the intellectual rigor, um, but because of how woke and really just kind of untethered from reality that I really felt like it, the education was. And we only read one side of things. We never read uh, accurate counter views. We, you know, the opposite views were always straw manned and kind of torn down really quickly. And then you moved on. And, and what was bizarre is I was pastoring and, uh, and leading a church during this time, and these ideas were not known about, uh, you know, outside of those halls of that university. I mean, this stuff was all the social justice stuff, all the critical race theory stuff, intersectionality, that stuff was alive and well in, in that institution. In fact, it was the air you breathe. The thing was, is when you left the building, you didn't hear this stuff anywhere. You didn't hear it. You didn't hear it coming from the entertainment world. You didn't hear it from the media. And you certainly didn't hear it from evangelical leaders. But that all changed in 2015 when the Michael Brown shooting came. This was the first time you started to hear some of the language that I heard in the institution at Vanderbilt start getting said by people that, you know, I had read their books. And I was like, whoa, it's been it's been six, seven years since I've heard somebody talk like that. And I certainly didn't expect it to come from you. And what I started to watch happen was what had once kind of stayed secluded in kind of the elite institutions, the secular institutions came spilling out into the culture through media, entertainment, um, and, and even in the evangelical world. And so I would say since that time, we've just seen more and more of that happen uh, with COVID, lots of questions about what's the authority or the rights of, you know, government officials to, you know, make decisions or inform what churches can or can't do. And what it really did is it just revealed something. It didn't create a fracture. It just revealed a fracture. What it showed was that Christians don't have a really good theology of what the role of government is, what the role of the magistrate is, and what is our role as Christian citizens to obey the magistrates or to 
exhibit civil disobedience, you know, zero, zero discipleship in that regards. And that's where I think you've had lots of division and fighting over in the in, in Christian circles, fighting over what's the proper response. How are we supposed to think about race and justice? And 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 look, Christians should be all for uh, you know getting rid of racism and all for justice issues. The issue became because we had not talked about those things a lot in Christian circles when those definitions got thrusted onto us and kind of hurled onto us by the culture and they were smuggled in with different meanings than what biblical meanings are. A lot of Christians didn't know what to do with that. Some took it hook, line, and sinker. Um, those who fought against it and maybe raised questions were deemed as racist. Or And, and that's where, I, I know I just threw a lot in there, but I think yeah. that's where the tumultuous kind of just unsettled nature of, of kind of the Christian world right now reason it finds itself there. Jesus' description of being his disciple in Luke 9, 14 raises the bar much higher than these modern requirements of being a Christian. Yeah. How does a church get back on track? What are some tangible things pastors can do? What are some tangible things Christians attending church and small groups, what can they do? So a, a threefold question there. And again, yeah. it's a big one, but there's just so much good meat on this, on the bone in this book. I just want to dig into these things. Yeah. First and foremost, pastors and Christian leaders need to go back to what do the gospels actually say? What does Jesus actually require? I think so much of the trouble we've gotten into is we kind of set the bar so low on what it means to be a Christian. It's kind of like you get to customize your own little experience, right? You get to you know, you can kind of choose your own adventure when it comes to being a Christian. And I take some of this, I take some of that, right? It's kind of a drag and drop. Here's my Christianity. And you just don't find that in the Bible, right? Jesus says to die to yourself. He says, take up your cross daily, follow me, which means you are to die daily, deny yourself daily, and follow what the Lord says. And the fact that we call him Lord means he's master and we're not. So I think pastors and churches have to get back to teaching this core message. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you. That's what Luke 14 gets into. Count the cost, Jesus says. If you're going to come follow me, make sure you count the cost. And if you don't count the cost, he says three times, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple, right? That Those are strong words. So I think we got to get back to that. Second, I think Christians have to go back to asking the question, what does God's word say about what it means to honor him and follow him? Again, I think we've got to move away from this language that we've really, you know, we've, we've kind of co-opted co you know, co into our, our vocabulary, which is, this, I feel like, right? I hear so many Christians say, well, you know, I just feel like God wouldn't, it's like, <laughs> You know, I, no disrespect, but it's like, who cares what you feel like? What does God say? I don't think Jesus wanted to be on the cross and die that way. I don't think he wanted or he felt That's like right. it. That's right. It wasn't about feeling. In fact, we know in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, if yeah. there's any way this cup can pass, <laughs> yes. nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will, Father. And so I think we got to get back to this, what does the Lord say? And how do I bow the knee to what the Lord says? Listen, even if I have to drag my, my wayward feelings with me, kicking and screaming, I, I think we've developed kind of this unspoken idea that if I feel it, it must be right. You know, I can't deny my feelings. I have to stay true to myself. Like that's secular discipleship. That's not biblical discipleship. That's the secular world saying, follow your heart. You know, if you feel it, you can be it. You know, you do you. These are secular creeds that Christians have somewhat absorbed. And we've kind of mingled it with some of our Christian teaching, and we've produced something very different. And I think we've got to go back to the Word of God, not just being something we affirm in name only, but we actually come under the authority of what it says, and we live it. I think that's what's missing. So I think Christian small groups, we've got to go back to, hey, what does God require of his people? Well, we know that from the Word. And we've always got to measure what we feel against that. If our feelings match what God's word say, then great. Follow your feelings <laughs> as you follow the word of God. But if your feelings do not line up with what the word of God says, then your feelings are actually called to come under his authority. I've enjoyed your book. I also really enjoy your Twitter account. There's, there's daily challenges. There's ways that kind of shift or even challenge my thinking. And part of that are you share articles you write. And today, yes. again, Tuesday. 
I loved your article, Dumping Disney. So give listeners a quick summary. Yeah. And please share where they can find this article so they can give it a read themselves. Yeah. So the article, uh, it's called Dumping Disney. It's at World Opinions. Uh, so World Opinions. Um, I wrote the article for a couple of reasons. One, you know, I love, I've always loved Disney. I've taken my kids to Disney. We, we had Disney Plus. I canceled it several months ago. Um, I typically go to every Disney Pixar movie that they release. All right. We love enjoying entertainment. But what's become very clear over the last several years and things that have been revealed is that Disney is not a fan or for uh, the things that Christians value at all. And not only are they not for what we value, but they are very much the antithesis of what we value. A lot of the secular woke ideology is what they are not only for, but they're activists for those things. Um, they have come out, there have been, you know, meetings that have kind of been unveiled, you know, from, you know, I guess they were Zoom meetings or team meetings that got recorded and were leaked that, you know, they are very much trying to promote LGBTQ plus uh, initiatives and goals and it, their movies and their storylines. And so, you know, they're, they're free to do that, right? They're welcome to do that. It's their own company. But I think Christians need to understand that is what they're committed to doing. Um, and as Steve Jobs once says, the storytellers are the most powerful people in the world because they're the ones who shape what people think. They're the ones that shape the next generation and what they believe and what they value. And Disney understands that. They understand that the stories they tell shape people's minds and they are trying to shape the minds of the next generation. And so I think Christians, I'm not calling for a boycott, but I, and I think every Christian has to use their own conscience. And, you know, where, where is your conscience? You got liberty to go to, to Disney parks if that's what you want to do, right? There's no law being laid down. But I think we've got to quit being naive. I, I think Disney is operating on a ton of borrowed capital from their past. Um, I, I think if Disney were a company that were one years old or two years old, and they were doing all the same things that Disney now are doing, both by way of what they produce um, the movies, the parks, everything, but we knew what we, what we know right now about them and what they try to teach and what they promote. I don't even think it'd be a question. I think most Christians would be like, Ooh, stay away from there. But I think what's happening is, is they've got 75 to hundred years almost of capital where we've got nostalgia connected to our favorite movies and characters and experiences at their parks. And, and we carry all that into the present and we give them the benefit of the doubt. And we forget like, no guys, they are very much trying to teach, you know, things that go against our faith altogether to your children. And so, you know, I think we've got to wrestle with that. And, you know, and I, I made a reference in the article, this isn't the same as Target or Apple or Google, right? Because I know one of the things that people listening might say is like, well, if Christians dump Disney, we got to go dump a lot of other people too. And I would first say, maybe, you know, maybe you should, but here's why Disney's different. Disney's different than Target because while Target may promote all these values as well, I can walk into Target, I can buy a pair of jeans, I can get some headphones, I can go buy some groceries in Target, and they're not trying to shape my worldview when I do it right? I, I'm, it's a pure commodity that I'm going in to buy and I'm leaving the store. Um, I, the Apple phone, you know, the iPhone, I can buy it. I can use the apps. My text messages send. Every time I send a text message, I don't get something back saying, have you thought about LGBTQ issues today? You know, I'm not getting <laughs> bombarded with these messages. I can still use the products. It's functional. Same for Google. I still get my email. I can still use the search engine. With Disney, their product is their stories, their product is their messaging. So when you consume Disney products, you are consuming Disney messaging. When you're consuming Disney messaging and products, you are consuming Disney values. And that's what makes them different. That's what makes it different than simply saying, hey, the bottle of water that I like to drink from, this company's woke. Well, as long as they're not putting woke in my water, I can keep buying this water. You know what I'm saying? And I think Christians are gonna have to do that in a world that's secular, right? That's just reality. But you don't have to keep exposing your children to indoctrination. That's a very different thing. It was great. I have nothing but good things to say about Nashville. Um, I was kind of a Nashville commuter, if you will, for like four years. I would go back for a couple of weeks. I'd write, uh, play, you know, mostly focused on songwriting, but I played writer's rounds and stuff whenever I could. And then I would go back to Oregon um, or the Northwest and I would play. 
And so it, it was a way for me to kind of make a living playing music, but also have a big presence in Nashville um, because I've always thought, you know, I'd rather be a big fish in a small pond, which is what I was able to do in the Northwest versus being in Nashville where you're a tiny fish in a big pond. And, you know, it, it would have been a lot more difficult for me to get back to those paying gigs in the Northwest if I was to say, I'm going to move full-time to Nashville. Um, not that I, I, wish that I could have done that but it just is there's no real big paying gigs there and so you'd have to get a part-time job which would then limit my ability to travel so I did this commuting thing for quite a while I uh, really worked on my catalog of songs uh, you know really kind of almost had like the college years of songwriting because I taught I was able to learn and get taught on how you have to have a hook of a song uh, you have to have you know kind of a three minute um, time frame for advertising and, and radio ready songs so it was a great way to learn um, and then after a while I, I kind of tried in Nashville a little bit to see if uh, things would happen but most of the offers I had to get a record label or something like that behind me was usually to say let's make you a Kelsey Ballerini Jr. or um, you know, a Carrie Underwood Jr. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of music at all. It's just that that's not me. And so I said, I, I would rather do it the hard way. And even if I don't become as successful at it, at least I know I'm doing it the Olivia Harms way, which is, you know, what I was put on this earth to do. And I'm not going to pretend I'm somebody else, somebody else. So it was a, a really good learning experience. And um, then I just kind of said, you know what, I've always loved playing music in, in Texas. So this Oregonian is going to start traveling <laughs> around in Texas, and uh, it's been great. I've loved it. Um, I started and I left Oregon um, in September of 21, and so I went down to Texas. I was here for probably three months, um, got home uh, just like the end of November, and then I decided that I was going to do it again because the first run was so successful that I said, okay, well, I'll do like a spring run. Um, and so I got down here like the end of February and I'm, I'm on the road until like mid-May or so. Um, and then I figured, you know, I really am not good at the humidity. So this is something we'll have to chat about again later, see how you deal with the humidity. Because being from <laughs> the north, you know, like we're used to heat. We get some heat in the summertime but the humidity is like totally different. And so I thought maybe since I have the trailer, like I won't do a full commit, like move yet. I can just do like a central US and then go back to the Northwest for a little while. Um, and then I'll come back down, you know, September, October, November, and I'll like do that whole thing again. Um, that way I can kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, so that's like the outline of how long I've been doing it. And then to answer the second part of your question, there's so many great memories that come with it. I mean, like living on the road, I don't think I was like, I can't say I was like shocked to see how many nice people are, but at the same time, there's like, it is, is shocking. Like, especially here in Texas, there's so many people who are just willing to open up their homes and say, come stay at my house. Uh, if I, if you just need an extension cord, like we'll give you an outlet, like, they are so welcoming and so happy to help however they can. And that has just been amazing. I've met so many great people that I, I just like feel like I've adopted into my little family on the road because I feel like now I have all these friends all over Texas that I can call up and say, hey, I'm coming through. Do you mind if I park my trailer? And um, I get to have like this adventure along with loving the travel and, you know, music because I just get to have all these amazing new connections and so the memories that I have made with all these new friends I think is my favorite because there's no way I would have ever met them if if I didn't live in a trailer <laughs> so my first question and the one I've been itching to ask you is how did you start as a stand-up comedian was it open mic night was it a, a bet from a, a friend who thought you're you're incredibly funny and wanted to see you try this this out as an open mic how did you start as a comedian? It was a combination of a few of those things. I was actually in a play in college. I started doing theater in uh, in college, and I was playing George Bush, George W. Bush, in a play called Stuff Happens. It was, uh, I think it was a Broadway show in, in England, and it came to the U.S., and uh, a friend of mine, I mean, George Bush is a funny guy. I don't think he knows he is, but... <laughs> um, a friend of mine saw me in the play and he goes, Hey, I, I had to do a stand up comedy show in the cafeteria at our college. 
you're going to do five minutes next Tuesday. He goes, you have to do stand up. And I was, I was just mortified. I was up, I was up for like a week writing jokes and uh, threw myself up there. It was an absolute train wreck. People probably walked out. A couple of people probably started crying. You just have no idea what the hell you're doing in the beginning. And then one of the next times I did it, uh, a friend, I was on a plane to Los Angeles and it was delayed like an hour on the tarmac. And a friend goes, um, he, he made a bet. I don't know how much money. He said, go do, go get up and do stand up uh, for everybody on the plane. So I stood up and I went and did like a few minutes. Um, and, uh, and here I am today. I love how this started making cute girls laugh. And then we have, we have some bets uh, on a plane to do yeah. stand up stuff. And not failing out of high school. So it's all, a, it's all important things. The stakes were high, man. They were high. And it's paid off for you, Tyler. You have over 50 million views of your pranks and sketches on YouTube. You've been on America's Got Talent. What's this wild ride been like for you? It's going to be a wild ride no matter what if you pursue anything in the arts. It's highly competitive. There aren't a lot of high paying jobs um, compared to how many people are pursuing it. So you have to love it regardless. Um, you have to make that your priority. It's just, just you, you have no other choice but to do it. But what's interesting, since I started um, pursuing all this, a lot has changed in the entertainment business. The streaming services came in. So I used to go to Los Angeles every year for what's called pilot season all the new TV pilots, you go and you audition, you hope you get a role and then you hope the TV show gets picked up and then boom, you're, you're in the cast of friends or Seinfeld or, you know, or whatever. Um, that, that stopped because streaming services can start a show any day of the week, um, any month of the year. Uh, so you've got, you've got that changing sort of platform with, um, I suppose no other way to put it than the woke ideology where now, Rather than talent, oftentimes it's we just want to we want to fill these roles. We want to, as the uh, producer or the the studio, we want a virtue signal that we have we can check every box. And they became they started to get vocal about that, and so I started to lose auditions, jobs, agents, explicitly because hey, you know, not the best time for white guys. We're not hiring white guys. I've been hired for jobs and then fired because they said yeah, it's going to be a better look if we have uh, someone who doesn't look like you. So it's been a it's been wild, and and all of that really forced me to double down on making my own content and really going for building a following. And so it's it, it, and then a lot of my videos get taken down or shadow banned because I made fun of Fauci and made fun of I make fun of everything. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's definitely been confusing, but I feel like I see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel here for at least a week or two. 